Today is reading from John 15, uh, verses 9 to 15. It's a passage like a number of passages in the Bible. It needs to be read carefully. It's the product of a Jesus community in the late 1st and early 2nd century. It needs, I think, to be read through the lens of blessing, the blessing of love, the blessing of giving and receiving love, the blessing of encouraging love and experiencing the phoenix of friendship arising from the repudiation of hierarchies and the blessing of joy. The text is simply an encouragement to abide in love. If you love God and love others, it says, in other words, you soak yourself in unconditional love, which is God, then you will abide in love and in joy. So copy, emulate one another. Copy, emulate Jesus in doing love, in doing kindness, in doing acts of compassion and justice. I visited an old friend uh, this week, Enid. She's 101. Sight and hearing and diminished memory somewhat too. But she abides in the love of her family. Both those close to and those far away. Both those living and those who have died. And in such abiding she knows and radiates joy. She's a delight to visit. I think we need to be wary of the phrase in this Johannine text about the greatest love being laying down your life for your friends. This verse can easily feed a sacrifice theology. And in this vein, it's often read at Anzac and Memorial Day, Remembrance Day services. While it can be read as literally a commentary on Jesus' own death, I think in the context of abiding in love, it makes more sense to understand it to be encouraging of a way of living, not a way of dying, where one's life is threaded by love into the lives of your family and community. So like with a a patchwork quilt, each patch finds its strength and purpose in being woven together with threads of love. Laying down your life, therefore, is about giving up your isolation and disconnection and finding yourself as part of a greater whole. The text then goes on to talk about friendship and such abiding in love and doing the acts of love the hierarchies like between masters and servants like between favored and unfavored will disappear and instead of the language of power and privilege we will use the language of friendship and come to know what friendship really is if you read this text in your Bible, you will probably find an asterisk next to the word servant. And at the bottom of the page, it will give an alternate translation, slave. Neither word fits. A rabbi like Jesus was fundamentally a teacher. And the name for students was disciples, not slaves, not servants. And there's no indication in any of the Gospels that Jesus ever understood or encouraged his disciples to think of themselves as servants or slaves. Which is another reason why I cringe when I hear this word servant leadership. So it begs the question, why include this word servant, slave, here? I'd like to suggest that the the master-servant language is deliberately inserted here as a critique of hierarchies, of power over others, 
relationships. Like the early creed in Galatians chapter 5 when Paul writes, there is no longer Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. Of course, those hierarchies existed and continue to exist in 1st century and 2nd century uh, Mediterranean. But Paul, like the author of the fourth gospel, is pointing to a new way of thinking of ourselves and those we are in community with as friends. Similarly with the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, a, a role that servants would do. This is not about encouraging his disciples to be servants, but a critique of class divisions, of some thinking of themselves as better than others. Abiding in love means that the old language and ways of power and privilege are to be put aside, repudiated, in favour of the language and ways of friendship. Here is a poem about love. It's titled, Love is Like the Rain. Blessed are those who know the joy of a friend, parent or child who accept us without rhyme, reason or reward. Who love us with a power that can withstand the assault of our doubt. Blessed are those who fall into the embrace of love, into the losing of doubt, into choosing the delight, the wonder, and the pain of acceptance without thought of gain. Blessed are those who awake to the gift of the giving, awake into something other and surprisingly without conditions. How strange is this? Isn't love like gold, needing to be paid for? Blessed are those who refuse to succumb or collude with the lies about love, that it must be earned or is a skill to be learnt, and we must be grateful like a beneficiary should. Blessed are those who give freely, unreservedly, all the love, respect and strength they can, but not all they would like to. Love is like the rain. It falls, refreshes, sustains, flows, watering our souls. This poem, Love is Like the Rain, is about unconditional love, about its power, even to withstand the assault of our doubt. Because secretly, and sometimes not so secretly, we don't believe that we are worthy of unconditional love. And so said the prodigal son to himself while working in the pig pen. This poem is about falling into the embrace of such unconditional love, such acceptance, falling without the thought of gain. When the prodigal son and his father embrace on that roadside outside, the house, were well, either thinking about gain, <clears throat> thinking about the consequences of their hug, or were they, as I would like to think, given over in that moment of embrace to something bigger than themselves, a grace, an amazing grace, love given and received, reciprocated and received, love with joy. Such unconditional love, as the poem says, is like a gift, something we awake to, a realization, a light coming on, but not in the head so much as in the heart. It's like our heart is stretched open wide. The unconditionality of this kind of love is other than what most of us have been told over the years. We've been told that love, like everything good that comes our way, 
has to in some way be deserved or earned or learnt. We have to be good or kind or fair. Then we will be loved. For everything has terms and conditions, the fine print, the dues that one day will need to be paid. The poem says, love is like gold, something that needs to be paid for thus can be traded. The prodigal son's brother believed this and could not believe that his father didn't. For the prodigal to come on home, there had to be conditions like repentance, like paying back what he took, like this or that or the other thing. Only then could he be unconditionally loved. Some people have a religion like that. When we've been told these things, we've been told lies about love. Love is not conditional on how we look, or dress, conform, or talk. Love is not conditional on good behavior. Love is not conditional on obeying. Love is not, keep my commandments, and then I'll love you. It's not that sort of thinking. Love is not conditional on accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior or any other theological belief or action. Rather, love comes as an unearned gift, something we awake to or experience with another. Unconditional love is like the rain. It falls where it wills. It's not controlled by our wishes, habits or merits. Falling is not conditional. And when it falls, our souls are watered. For there is something about love that makes everything, life, living, relationships, giving, makes it all worthwhile. This language I'm using about love, about awakening, about falling into, about embrace and acceptance, about gift without needing or expecting reciprocity. All this is fundamental to my understanding of God. God, whether you write it with an uppercase or lowercase, is this unconditional love. In the parable of the prodigal son, it's a mistake to make the father into God. The father is certainly an admirable character. But the purpose of the parable is not to divinize the Father, but to emulate his inclusive love and his desire to bring reconciliation between his two boys. It is that embracing love the Father displays which points to the radical nature of Jesus' theology. And accepting, forgiving love is more important than the prosperity of even the viability of the family farm and business. Even after a public shaming by both sons, loving the wayward one is more important than seeking the restoration of honour. Love when hurt does not harbour resentment, but goes out to the roadside and waits and hopes. Love leaves the feast, to listen to the hurts of the elder brother. Love is patient, kind, forbearing. So, in thinking of this Easter season, to believe in the resurrection, to live a resurrected life, I think it's to allow yourself, myself, to be soaked in the rain, to be loved unconditionally, to be refreshed, sustained and enlivened by it, to accept this gift of grace. And then, to stretch the metaphor, be that reign of unconditional love for others, accepting others, being a friend, a community of friends, to and with each other. Blessings to you this week.